right, so we'll go ahead and get started. And we have a few more people who will be joining us. If you want to, you know, move in or move up, you're more than welcome to. Um, but welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Maria Emanuel. I'm the Associate Director of UNH Innovation, and we're really glad to have so many new faces join us for our monthly Catalyst Seminar. Um, so what we try to do with this program is to provide an opportunity to have discussions about innovation and entrepreneurship. And this year we've been doing a theme um, called A Conversation About. We've been inviting New Hampshire businesses to come and talk about problems that they face in their areas. And then UNH researchers who talk about the trends and the research that they see in that area and really just facilitate conversations and dialogue. And importantly, to bring people together in the same room that might have shared interests or commonalities and foster those conversations. Tonight we're going to take a little bit of a detour about that and we're going to look a little more inward and look at fostering the, an entrepreneurship community here within the University of New Hampshire. So before I introduce our speakers, um, we have just a couple things to cover and everybody come on in. Uh, next seminar is on Thursday, March 25th and our topic will be crowdfunding. And then there will be an open house um, to celebrate our beautiful new space. And that's going to be on Tuesday, April 19th. And there will be more information um, and details as we get closer to our events. We wanted to say a thank you to our generous sponsors for this year's Catalyst Seminar. We have Finch and Maloney, which is uh, based in New Hampshire. It's an IP counseling and services firm for technology companies. We have Jonathan Raymond and Rebecca Kristen back there um, joining us tonight, so thank you. And also to Finch and Maloney, um, which has offices in Concord, Hillsborough, and Portsmouth, uh, providing legal services to the people, businesses, and municipalities of New Hampshire. There's a networking session. You've already started it. We're going to continue it after um, the session. So we hope that you can stay and join us for that. And uh, please remember, you need to be 21 and older to um, enjoy the alcoholic beverages, but there's water for everybody otherwise. Um, also, we have some, um, some groovy t-shirts that are um, celebrating the new East Center that you'll be hearing about tonight. So if you haven't um, grabbed one, please feel free to take one on your way out. There will be tables set up and sizes and um, gender-specific shirts and lots of, uh, lots of options. So hopefully we can find one for you. So that's all that I have for housekeeping. Where is Mark? Mark, you want to come up and share a few words. And after that, we will go ahead and introduce our speakers. You should be mic'd. Unless you want me to stand right next to you, I'm going to give you the whole kit and caboodle. All right. What I wanted to do, if we've not met before, I think I've met most of you, but if we haven't met, I'm Mark Saddam. I'm the Associate Vice Provost for Innovation and New Ventures. Um, what I wanted to do is take two minutes to frame this particular conversation. Um, the most common thing that I hear from people is, what exactly are you doing with all this stuff? Right? So I wanted to give you a little bit of history, which will lay up into uh, Andrew and Ian's conversations. So when we started, or when I came here in 2010, the objective was, I was not the Vice Provost for Innovation and New Ventures. Um, I was hired as the Director of Technology Transfer. And the goal was to get more of the university's ideas protected, dealt with, and put out into the world. So uh, with Maria's help, okay, fair, mostly Maria. Um, <laughs> you know, we really focused in on what do we need to do to try to commercialize more university technology. And so we've done that really well. Um, in 2010, when I joined, we did eight licenses. Last year, we did 350. Uh, we probably lead the country in licensing. And yes, including MIT and Stanford and all those great places. We had do the greatest number of licenses in the United States with the data that I have, right? So we do that fine. Um, people are looking for revenue. We actually focus on use. So the objective was how can we get the technology used the greatest number of times? Now the great thing is, if you get a technology used and you can make money, you make more money. So in that framework, we've, we've actually uh, tripled revenues and, and hopefully we'll crack a million dollars in royalty income this year. So that's good. So once we got that straight, the next question was, well, what do we do? We want to we start more companies. So how does that work? So we, we had invested in an organization called the NHICC. Some of you might remember the New Hampshire Innovation Commercialization Center. 
which then morphed um, into what you now know as Alpha Loft. And the objective of the investment in Alpha Loft was to say, when ideas come out of the university, there's somebody on the other side to say, hello, you know, we take it, we sort of focus on the technology, we protect the technology, but universities rarely com excuse me, commercialize technology. Companies do. So we partnered with Alpha Loft with the objective that technologies that came out of the university would have a soft landing outside, there would be somebody to take care of them, there would be somebody who's paying attention to them. A couple of years into that process, which everything's sort of still going well, you know, we weren't seeing the startup activity that we really wanted the com that, for that particular thing. So we kind of retrenched and do what we actually, so I teach, some of the students are here, and we do what we tell the students to do is pivot. And you say, well, what, why aren't we getting that? Why aren't we getting more ideas coming out in terms of startups? Why isn't there more entrepreneurship on campus? And that led to the creation of a couple of things. One was the founding of the E-Center um, to focus on getting more entrepreneurial activity, more entrepreneurial thinking and doing with the goal of commercializing more technology through a startup route. But in Ian's time, he'll talk about how he's expanded that definition. Um, and also, we, we went after a couple of grants that Andrew will talk about too um, with the objective of increasing creative collisions. So first, we wrote a grant so that we could teach the lean startup methodology in the business school. That worked out okay. I took that brought it into the engineering school, that worked okay. We then just received, uh, wrote a grant called Pathways to Innovation, which is about knocking the engineers and the business students' heads together to make more fun things happen. Um, so we're just off that, and I know Andrew will talk about that. Um, and then we also just were awarded an i grant, which is a real win for UNH, which is a, and I know you'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's a, um, a $300,000 grant to help accelerate the commercialization of technologies through this lean startup process through startup companies. And so that's kind of what led us to today. The building that you're in, if some of you are here for the first time, it's pretty cool. We're still excited. Um, but it's, that, it's another piece of the puzzle is can we create an environment where people want to do things, where people knock heads together, where creative collisions occur. So all of this, think about it as a puzzle. And as we're, as we're going along, we're putting pieces of the puzzle in place to have this sort of soup to nuts attractiveness for, for getting technologies out of the university, but also we're learning new things and we're constantly saying, what do we need to do? What are we missing? What, are we, what do we need to focus on to continue this process of getting more technologies out the door? So I wanted to use that as a framework for the discussion that Ian and Andrew will have. And then Ian's going first or you're going to introduce? Me again. Maria's going to introduce. <laughs> Okay, so with that introduction, let me take the next step, which is to tell you a little bit more about our speakers tonight. So going in reverse order, because that's why I wrote my notes, we're going to start with Andrew. And Andrew um, Earl is an assistant professor of strategic management and entrepreneurship in the Paul College, our neighbor, sort of around the corner, and joined UNH three years ago after spending a lifetime in the Pacific Northwest and probably appreciative of days like today. <laughs> Um, in mid-February, <laughs> and he earned his MBA with uh, an entrepreneurship concentration and a PhD in management from the University of Oregon. So Andrew's research um, grew out of a long-held fascination the transformational power of new technologies, and he looks at new ways of understanding something that a lot of us think about, how do technologies move from that initial um, invention to the marketable products. And he has areas of specialization and um, concepts that are cool, right? <laughs> Just cool to many of us. And they intrigue and inspire us as well. Innovation-oriented business strategy, technology entrepreneurship, organizational ambidextry, and inter-organizational networks. And so he focuses on disruptive innovations in fields like chemistry and energy, as well as other um, high potential fields. And like all engaging enterprising entrepreneurs, Andrew teaches, Andrew does research, um, you're an advisor to the Holloway Prize competition. Um, the Entrepreneurship Club here at UNH, and Brew, New Hampshire, which I'm sure is completely academic in its focus, too. Yeah, it's service to the community. Yeah, somebody's got to do it. So <laughs> there I have a board member here, actually, too, so I think now And then we also have Ian, who is the director, um, the first director of the Peter T. Paul Entrepreneurship Center. And Ian joined us just in November of the past year. And Ian comes with a history of significant startup and innovation experience. His first two companies were PlanetResume.com and Hot Chili Technology, and they were bootstrapped, merged, and acquired by a publicly traded group called Personnel Group in America. 
And for some reason, you s vowed never to bootstrap another company, and I can't imagine why. So then his next company was VillageGenie.com, and this was venture-backed. You listen to your own advice. And it's a, um, it built private labeled career centers for colleges and universities acquired by a division of Global Fortune 500 at DECO. And um, interestingly, after that success, Ian, who makes vows, vowed never to have another venture capital backed company again. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious what sweet spot you're looking at now, but maybe it's here. And so from his entrepreneurial background, the concierge group of American Express recruited him to help um, in the innovation of new products and services for their platinum and black centurion card members, which is um, quite interesting. Ian was named Boston Business Journal's top 40 under 40. And if, um, for example, during our networking period, you'd like to practice your conversational Swahili, he's your man. <laughs> OK, so um, you both have presentations. There will be time at the end for Q&A. And we hope you enjoy the seminar. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for everyone for coming for this way. Um, just before I get going, one of the things I gave a presentation a couple weeks ago to the, some of the trustees at the foundation, and one of the things I say is I've lived on the Seacoast for 13 years and, and embarrassingly didn't know that much about UNH. And within the first couple of weeks, I've been absolutely blown away by the quality of who's here from a staff, uh, faculty, researchers from the facilities. And for me, it's just a wonderful foundation to be able to start to build what's going to be a really exciting sort of continued sort of building the entrepreneurship culture here. Um, this is sort of our first event uh, for the e-center in the space, <clears throat> so to talk about it, so it's sort of a quasi-launch, which is why the free beer here. Um, and at the end, I'm going to have audience participation, so you're all warned, so at the very end, we're going to have just a small little exercise to know about that. Um, high level, I'm going to talk about entrepreneurship and sort of what I have sort of discovered over the last uh, three or three plus months here, and what we're trying to think about building and that piece of it, and then really talk about the e-center and some of the vision uh, and steps that we're taking there. Um, just by show of hands, I'm curious, how many people here have started a company? Great. How many people have started two companies? Great. How many of you see something every day or sometimes and say, this is a pain in the ass, I have a better idea of how to fix that? Great. <coughs> so that leads me to my definition, the definition that I'm starting to put on here is that entrepreneurship is not all about starting companies. What it really is is about seeing a problem somewhere. It can be in technology, it can be day-to-day, -day, it can be whatever it is, and or having ideas or having solutions to that problem. Converting those ideas into actions and then actions into ventures. And if every student and every faculty member did that day-to-day, -day, that's, a, that's a major success for us uh, as we look at that. And again, that can be innovations, that's innovations, that's uh, inventions, products, Startups can be in technology, can be in services, can be in social entrepreneurship. It can be lifestyle companies. It doesn't make any difference. It's all things that sort of relate to that. And my best examples is Facebook, right? Everybody's heard of Facebook. Facebook did not start as a company. It started as Face Mash. So while not politically correct, and you may know this story, Mark Zuckerberg basically wanted to have something to compare photos of women, girls, at Harvard online. And we all know where that went. But when I talk to students and people who have ideas about this, we always say, it's not about, don't think about it as a company. Think about what you're, what you're solving, and then it will take its natural course from there. So I found this graphic, actually, just a week or two ago. I actually posted it up on, on our, our Twitter. Uh, and I love it. I love it for two reasons. One, this is why I get really excited. This is why I love this job already three months into it. Because you look at this 18 to 35 year olds, there's a huge groundswell for that. It's hard to see. 70% of teens say they want to be an entrepreneur. That is fantastic. That means that's ripe here at UNH. And it also means that we're already seeing it in high schools, in middle schools, or innovation centers, or entrepreneurship centers. There's maker spaces. So as students will be coming through the doors of here at UNH, they will already have some inclination towards this. And we are able to be here to sort of give them that warm hug. The other piece is here, 74% of students say there's no access to entrepreneurship resources on campus. Well, that's not going to be the case here at UNH. It already isn't and hasn't been. It's going to magnify from there. So at a high level, one of the things that I've noticed in sort of talking to all the deans, senior members, administrators, students, faculty, 
is that there's a lot going on here at UNH, amazing amount, in different corners, in different silos. And so one of our missions basically is this thing of this vision of stitching together all the pieces that are already there and then adding to it. So we created this, this graphic or this image about it, which is called the power of E. And you'll see it around here. Hopefully you'll see it more often going forward. Hopefully the back of the t-shirts, you'll wear it. We'll start to spread it out from here. But the power of E is the power of entrepreneurship, which is educate, to engage, to establish, and to expand. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the education piece because uh, Andrew's going to talk about that. But clearly the academic piece is really important and critical to that step. The engage piece is the E Center sort of being the go-to place for all things being entrepreneurial here on campus. Create excitement, explore ideas, convert those ideas into actions. And here are some of the things. And again, we're not creating most of this. This is stuff that's here that we're stitching together to be able to be a hub to be able to direct and redirect uh, students, faculty, researchers, alumni. Once that, those ideas have taken shape and into actions, there needs to be some level of establishment. So it's business model building, some prototypes, some MVPs, execution plans, really getting out into the market, talking to prospective customers to validate it. Uh, and then we have, have a wonderful resource here with the eLoft, that's space for interactions, boot camps, coaching, mentoring, and offices. Now, and I say this a couple times for students particularly, but also faculty. Those tables, so the green booths and the other table out there, those are for you. Those are for you to come with your friends, with ideas, with your teammates, to sit and huddle and use that space. That's where the energy happens. And I'll talk a little bit later about the other universities they've been to. And you see it, it's amazing and it's interdisciplinary. So realize that that is there for you guys to use. An expansion, again, once there's traction, how do we start to do it? We have alumni mentors, we have industry mentors. They can mentor you, they can open up networks to you. Additional grants and competitions, access to funding through angel venture capital, and then helping in that sort of key part of sort of the employer piece. Now just to talk a little bit about the E-Center. Number one misconception, isn't the E-Center part of Paul College? No, nope, nada, hapana, that's Swahili for no. We are in intentionally independent of any one college, and that's actually a really healthy thing. Because what we don't want is someone who's at the T school, or SEPS, or COLA, or COLSA, to feel like they don't want to walk in and maybe interact with MBAs. We want to be a neutral place, a safe place to come, that the natural energy happens, the collision happens internally here. And that's a really positive thing. So we're here really to serve all students, every corner of campus, faculty and alumni. As I mentioned, we're going to be the go-to place for all things entrepreneurial. And we do that in two fashions. We have this amazing facility, and I'm really a beneficiary of only being in Greg for a month before I got to move here. So this is a, really a luxury. Uh, as you may have seen coming in, so we have student clubs here. Obviously, Alpha Loft is here at the E-Center. I'm going to talk more about the makerspace, but this is really exciting. We just got um, a donation from several alumni to build a makerspace in the back. Talked about the co-working areas again. And then if you walked in, there's an idea connection board. And I actually uh, saw this at Babson when I was down there. And it's intentionally low tech because you have to come here and you need to write it. So not everyone has the idea of the year. But a lot of people want to be involved in something early stage. So it's a matching system. You see the way out, it's green cards, yellow cards. If you have an idea, but you don't have all the, the services or skill sets, you need to bring somebody in, you can post that. If you want to get involved, you can talk about what you want, and the idea is to do that. So we're going to continue to have more of that, but the idea is to have this physical space. And then we're in the middle of constructing a new website that will be, again, all things, and not just internal, but external. And there's a lot of things sort of externally, um, and we're get sort of learning best practices from other schools. So where does the e-center impact on campus? So when you look at just sort of entrepreneurship, obviously if you're an entrepreneurship ma major, you're in Paul College. And you're the top of the triangle of the pyramid. The entrepreneurship minor, which Neil, if Neil's here tonight, may not be. Yep, there he is. So he's working diligently to help uh, create that. Um, and so that all of a sudden now sort of opens up the universe for students and other colleges to be able to sort of tack that on as part to their regular major. But the bulk of what goes on, it's in the lower part of the pyramid. And this is where the e-center sort of plays, right in the hub of it. So again, create the excitement, help explore the ideas, 
put those ideas into action and actions into ventures. Very high level, we're going to be successful when you have a culture of entrepreneurialism on campus for all students. We're going to create programs that introduce, and I want to stress that, introduce and support students in that engagement. And one of the things that I learned in sort of, in sort of my listening sessions and going around is that a lot of students, a fair amount of students, either have financial or time constraints to actually be able to purchase or buy a credit course. That's a perfect space for us to be able to help out. There's the interest and there's the desire to want to do that. So we're going to create programs, light versions of programs, for them to be able to do at nights, weekends, whatever it ends up being, so that they don't lose out on that knowledge as they apply to it only because they're constrained by finances or by sort of uh, curriculum issues. Again, we're going to support faculty, staff, and researchers. So Mark had talked about sort of the connection to uh, UNH Innovation and the technology and the $100 million of research grants. I've already talked to two or three faculty who are really interested in converting their idea of technology into a company. What does that start to look like? So we're a resource there for that as well. We're well on our way, and if we do all these things together as collectively as a team, I am absolutely convinced that we will be recognized as one of the top entrepreneurial universities, and that's, that's a really good goal to shoot for. So a little bit of who plays. Talked a lot about students, faculty, research. Any one of those is good, but it's a little bit wobbly. The way it works best is to engage the alumni and the community, which I've plugged in parents as part of that. So there's this cross-engagement between all these groups will make it really strong. So an Envision an alumni, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but an Envision alumni who comes back with an idea needs support of which we're here to help them, and they want to interns. Well, we have the students who want to engage in internships with startups. It's this perfect synergy to be able to do. So we'll continue to sort of build that from where it is today. As I mentioned, uh, can't do it alone. Right now, it's me. Uh, we're interviewing for our program manager. But I can't do this, right? So it's, it's really critical to have really strong partnerships throughout to be able to help grow this. So academically, for obvious reasons, we do a lot with Paul College and engage a lot with them and helping with them uh, and help, then helping us sort of facilitating that piece. SEPS, because of what Andrew's going to talk about, the recent grant, there's a natural synergy there. Center for Social Innovation uh, is Fiona Wilson, and so the SVIC, obviously there's a lot of potential synergies there right off out of the gate. And soon, the goal is to be engaged with every college and university to sort of help with that. At the E-Center, we talked about Alpha Loft, which is an incubator and accelerator. It's a little bit different than their Manchester and, and Port, uh, Portsmouth offices. It's a little bit of a hybrid because we have students, we have faculty, but the core guts and the, and the skill set and the energy is there. Makerspace, which will be student run and actually was initiated by a student in a petition. Uh, the entrepreneurship and the tech house clubs have used, are using this as their home. We have legal drop-in hours with Paul Remus uh, for any student or faculty to come in and bounce ideas off. So again, sort of this partnership of all. <coughs> alumni, so I inherited sort of a, an initial group of alumni. There are six or seven wild catalysts who have generally, generously given uh, a first round as founding members. Uh, we're continuing to expand that to be able to be offering network and network, uh, networking uh, and mentorship. And then from the community, based upon some recent uh, press that went out about the E-Center, um, Raka and Catch Fire, who are digital marketing agencies in Portsmouth, both of their founders are, are UNH alum. And one of the things they said is, we wish we had this when we were here. And one of them, uh, Raka, started in the door, his dorm room. So Duncan started in his dorm room. So not only are they going to give sort of advice, they've actually, they're going to give time of their companies up to 20 hours to help do production time. That could be logo design, that could be production time. So it's really exciting. Again, it starts, as the word starts to get out, it starts to come together. You can sort of see that, that synergy between it all. Some initial projects that we're doing. So in addition to sort of creating the awareness and of the e-center and sort of entrepreneurship, um, this is the second year of the summer seed grant that started at uh, sort of May of last year, or April, May of last year. Um, like all good startups, we learned from it. We made some modifications, enhanced it to roll it out again. And that's actually just went live today. So the focus on this is to really focus on early stage or ideas that students have. The problem is, with tuition what it is, most students don't have the luxury to do that over the summer. They have to get a summer job. So we're, we're taking two issues and we're combining it to say we solve it for you. So for $3,500, 
uh, per, per, per student. It can be a team of three or three individuals, depending upon how it works out. They can work for nine weeks on their idea and startup. They'll be based here out of Alpha Loft and working with mentors and, and teams we bring in. And they get paid $3,500 so they don't have to find a summer job. So that's funded by the E-Center. It's funded by Wild Catalyst Network. Uh, and Kenny Monk Savings, who's our new neighbor across the street, uh, is part of that process as well. So really exciting. So for your students, you'll see stuff. Hopefully you, your mailboxes were jammed uh, yesterday with some information. Uh, you'll see more and more and really encourage. The deadline of that's April 4th, so you have time. Um, but really exciting. We can talk about that after if anyone's interested. So this is very exciting. Uh, the makerspace uh, at the E-Center, which is 3D printers, laser cutters, scanner tools. So this is student focused. Again, it's to create a destination for more students from all walks. So maybe a fine arts major, or anyone can come to start to tinker around and start to play with and get their hands dirty with 3D printers and laser cutters, all the way to, to those who want to have a prototype for whatever their idea is. It's coordinated with student leaders. So Matt Griswold, I don't know if he's here yet. He'll be here shortly. So he started this before I got here. He set a, a, a petitioner on campus. He got two or 300 signatures saying we would love to have a makerspace on campus. I was introduced to him thanks to Maria. It's a perfect synergy for here. And we've taken off and we presented to uh, the Wild Catalyst. Uh, and they're very supportive and they're funding the first uh, tier of that. Uh, and you can sort of see, uh, this is sort of a rough schematic of, of what it makes start to look like. This is the University of Maryland to give you some sense of what a makerspace is. The goal is to have this up and operational by the end of April. Student run will continue to expand in phases as we learn about it and go from there. Alumni I talked about sort of being a key piece, so we'll continue to build the alumni network, funding, mentoring, networking, uh, and this area which I've been calling X plus 5 or X plus 10. At MIT, at Stanford, even the top schools, very few companies are actually generated in the undergraduate years. Most of what happens is the student graduates, you have student loans, you get a real job, whatever that means, but at some point, there's the aha moment and they're ready to jump in. And that could be five years later, it could be 10 years later. And so the goal here is to be a source. So whether they came through this already as a, as a culture and an environment, or whether they're already out and want to come back, that's an important piece that we'll continue to, to engage with, A to A is alumni to alumni. Uh, and then finally, we sort of look at the program development for the fall of 2016. So we've been doing a lot this past fall into the spring. So we're developing co-curricular programs with faculty and the Alpha Loft that can be really sort of customized to the specific needs. Because the content might be 80% the same, but it has to address what the specific needs are of the customer, faculty, students in this case, and develop that to be able to be robust to be able to help out. So as I mentioned, uh, these are the universities I went to. I met sort of my counterparts at all of them. I, I, my kudos to all of them. They are amazingly embraceive, continue to email me with idea. Very, very supportive and very excited that UNH is doing this. Uh, the top picture is actually some of the co-working space at MIT. When you go in there, the place was deafening, as you can imagine. Um, re really, really exciting. Uh, this is Harvard's iLab, which is amazing, as you expect for Harvard to be. Uh, but they have lockers, uh, and then they talk about sort of the companies uh, or adventures that the students are involved with. So we're going to create that out here as well with the working space. So just in general, so please follow us, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, UNH eCenter is the uh, tag um, and more to come on that and then we're come to the part here which is um, if I could just get the videographer to come up so one of the key mantras of entrepreneurship is uh, taking risks being uncomfortable um, and then the metaphor here of the pebble I sort of look at this as sort of the pebble in the pond like I said I can't do this alone UNH Innovation can't do it alone. It takes everyone in this room to go from here and to spread out, to talk about, which is why the t-shirts and stickers, if you've seen them, um, please go forth with them and put them everywhere. Um, so one of the things I want to do is to make sure that everyone is sort of on board with this. So again, this is awkward. Probably the first time I've ever done in Catalyst Seminar history. But that's what about taking chances. And it may flop, and that's OK. So if I could ask everybody to stand up. So I was at a UNH hockey game, and there was a chant that uh, we believe that we can win. Same chant, except for we believe in the power of E. All right? Three times. 
We don't remember why. So it's free beer and t-shirts. So I have to get something out of this. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So on three. You're not going to make us jump, right? No, no. Okay. Yes, we believe in the power of E. 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 All right, thank you for indulging me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, my, my talk's a little bit shorter, um, and I hit on a couple of things that uh, Ian does. No chanting, none of that involved. <laughs> but I'm really here to focus on what the students are doing. And I think especially if you're outside of UNH, it's easy to think about the students as sort of this abstraction, right? They're sort of, uh, you know, they're doing their things on campus. We know there's about 15,000 of them here, but we don't necessarily really know what goes on behind the scenes. We can reflect back to our own time in college. That may or may not be a good guide for what's going on. And so actually, I, I brought a couple of real life students with me. So uh, Alex and, and Erica, if you can raise your hand. So Alex is uh, the president of the UNH Entrepreneurship Club and a founder of that club. And Erica is one of our founding members too. And we sort of consider her our marketing and social media. Uh, Maven, and then Scott was here earlier, but he had to leave. And he's the guy who brings kettle corn to our meetings, which is really important. Uh, we meet right here. Um, we've had upwards of 60 students come to a meeting on a Monday night, and uh, we were pretty impressed by that. We average about 30 uh, from all different disciplines, and it's been really exciting. Uh, so before I talk about that, I want to give you a tiny bit about my background, and I promise I'm going to talk about Danish shipping and other stuff, but it's all going to make sense here in just a couple of seconds. So I got interested in this idea of innovation networks facing a lot what we're facing right now at UNH. So at University of Oregon, we had this kind of venture launch pathway program where if we just had an idea, we knew how to bring it to market. And then we had kind of the sciences uh, led by this thing called the green product design market. And again, I'm from Oregon, so this kind of thing doesn't sound maybe quite as, as hippy-dippy as it does here, the green product design uh, network. Um, but what we realized is that this really wasn't working. And so our immediate brainstorm was, yeah, we know how networks work. We all research networks. We've all been part of putting networks together. So you know what we'll do is we'll bring in a whole bunch of other partners. And now for those of you who don't know, University of Oregon doesn't have an engineering school, doesn't have a medical school. So the things we were finding are these things deep in science, right? Things that could get to market in 10 years if you had $20 million and you were super, super patient. So deep, deep science type stuff. And so what we did is we went shopping for partners who would have good ideas that we could feed into the system. We even partnered with our rival school, Oregon State, big engineering school, kind of like UNH. Uh, Nettle, which is a national laboratory dealing with uh, energy, it's National Energy Technology Laboratory. Uh, we also worked with private companies like Microsoft. If you guys ever get into like Microsoft's back room, they have so much stuff sitting on the shelf that they just don't have the time or energy to focus on developing. It's not part of their core business, right? And so they led us kind of into their back room to see what they had to play with. It was really exciting. And then, of course, we worked with uh, some really kind of marquee national labs. Anybody who's been up to the Northwest knows Pacific Northwest National Lab, uh, Argonne National Laboratory, some others that are kind of these you know, major hubs in the uh, network of national laboratories. So this was great, but it actually produced a major problem. We had tons of ideas. We were flooded with ideas. All four of these organizations, as well as our own university, had ideas just coming out of their ears. And so we couldn't really handle all of that, right? Some of the stuff was going to the venture launch pathway. Some was going to the green product design where nobody knew what was going on. And so we actually had to look internally and start actually strengthening our own network. And this is what we came up with. We said, hey, it's great to have all these ideas come in, but if there's no support to sending them out the other side, there's really no point in bringing in all the ideas. And this has worked uh, tremendously well for almost 10, 10 years now. And so this kind of jogged my fascination with networks in general. And not the idea that networks are important, everybody knows that, it's obvious. But how they can actually be intentionally designed to drive certain outcomes. And it's amazing, you go and talk to major companies. I was on the phone a couple of months ago now, about eight weeks ago, with a VP at Dow Chemical. And she did not really know what her organization's network was. I mean, they knew who their joint venture partners were, but who were their partners' partners, whether or not they were partners with each other, who their researchers were collaborating with. Really no idea at all. And that's a big, sophisticated company right? that cares a lot about this kind of stuff. And um, so what we found, actually, by doing a lot of research on big, messy things like this, is that um, it turns out not only do networks matter, but how they're structured matter. And you can structure them intentionally to drive certain outcomes. And so this is an example of uh, some processes that we study here in chemistry. This is redesign of the synthesis for ibuprofen. Uh, it makes it about three to four times more efficient to produce. And the company that invented this new process also got a patent on something that had been off patent for about 30 years. So amazing, amazing competitive advantage. And again, we tested that in this kind of big, na uh, nasty uh, uh, mess of collaborations in uh, chemicals and in pharmaceuticals. Uh, just as of Tuesday, actually, 
and I should have actually told Mike Miranda this because he's my, he's my boss. Uh, I got asked to uh, go to Denmark actually to help out with uh, a network that's being led by Man uh, Diesel and Turbo, which is the world's largest manufacturer of these like three-story diesel engines for ocean-going ships. And it turns out that they're actually really trying to be intentional about designing and having their network evolve to meet their needs to come up with the world's uh, next generation of cargo ships. So these things are amazing, right? I mean, triple the giant half the footprint. Six times less emissions so moving three times as much cargo with half the emissions. And they're working with uh, Maersk, who's one of the world's biggest shipbuilders and uh, shipping companies. And I'm really excited to be able to participate in this and actually do all this academic research stuff we do and actually make it real for real companies that are interested in it. So what this has to do with students, and I promise you that it does, is I started to think about sort of the ecosystem we have here as a network and what I would do if I were to think about designing the network. And so we have this great network, right, called the UNH Innovation Ecosystem. We have Mark and uh, Maria and Ian and others working on making this even more robust. But from the business school perspective, and I'm saying this from my perspective of what the business school perspective is. Mike, I'm not teach, uh, talking for the entire business school. This is not policy of the business school. But none of this really, really matters if the students, especially the undergrad students, aren't involved. And that's probably not the same for the sciences and other things, but in Paul College, the vast, vast majority of students we have are undergraduate students. So if they're not figuring out some way to meaningfully plug into this, it's not that it doesn't matter overall, it just doesn't necessarily matter to me, honestly, in a lot of ways. So how can we actually do that? Well, it turns out that the students are there and they are <coughs> interested. They're actually really, uh, really interested. So not only do we have students, like this interdisciplinary team right here, designed a new way to aim solar panels to make them 22% more efficient. Same old solar panel, just a really smart way of aiming it that doesn't actually draw any of the electricity or anything from the panel itself. But again, we have our entrepreneurship club that we, uh, we, founded, uh, we founded last year, and this is our first year of full operations, and uh, Alex and Erica and their team have been absolutely amazing. Again, Monday evening, we'll have 50 or 60 students from almost all the colleges at UNH. And it's a totally, st I mean, I sort of, I, I buy you guys food and stuff, but it's completely student-driven, student-directed, which is absolutely awesome. So to borrow a quote from if you were, grew up in the 1960s, you'll recognize this as being from The Who. If you grew up in the 1990s, you'll recognize the inverse of this is from The Offspring, which is a band. Again, if you grew up in the 90s, you see some, a couple smiles here, right? And that's, in fact, that the kids are absolutely all right. And what made me think about this, actually, is I was uh, sharing a ride to an airport with somebody who was about my mom's age and was just sure that everything was going to hell in the handbasket because the millennials couldn't do anything, right? And uh, I'm six days too old to be a millennial, so I can talk about millennials <laughs> as others, right? It's, it's kind of fun. Uh, but I, find myself, I found myself talking to this woman and explaining to her this very thing, that the world actually, that the kids actually are all right, and they're doing amazing things, and all they need is a little bit of a support from folks like uh, Mark and Ian and, and Mike and Neil and other people um, who kind of have check writing authority to buy some pizza or some, some Thai food, which is our go-to, right? For, we have gluten-free members in our club. Uh, but everything is is really good and there's a tremendous amount of energy on campus around entrepreneurship. So really fast, a couple of the drivers I see, a lot of interest in general. The idea that you talk to one another about your startups is something that's becoming to be, the, uh, starting to be the norm here, which is really exciting. Um, a lot of people list role models, people like Elon Musk and others, right? That's who they look up to. Uh, growing institutional support, we're working on that and a lot of community support. But there certainly are some barriers as well. Time is a big one. And I actually really mean that. And anybody who doesn't think that our students are pressed for time, try to follow them around for a week and see how you feel at the end of it. And Jake Chauvin's here, if you haven't realized it too, he's one of the founders of the club. Sorry, Jake, didn't see you there. And so I do a survey every semester with all my students. And as it turns out, the 43 students I had in my business strategy class uh, last semester, um, 32 of them had part or full-time jobs. Another eight were intercollegiate athletes on our hockey and volleyball team. Most of those jobs, they work between 20 and 40 hours a week at those jobs. They also find time to volunteer in their communities. Many of them are also helping with uh, care of a grandparent or a parent or a brother or sister's kids or stuff like that. So time absolutely is a constraint. Because they're in class 16 hours a week doesn't mean they spend the rest of it. Well, some may spend the rest of it, you know, drinking beer at Libby's or something. But in general, they're not doing that, right? But time really is a, uh, a constraint. Uh, guidance, I think we do our best, but I think that stat that Ian cited about people don't know that there's resources uh, available. Um, this is something that I think is really interesting, the third point, again, being a, uh, somebody who relocated here from the West Coast, uh, the way we treat failure, right? 
And again, you go down to San Francisco, you go to Seattle and other places, and people have failure parties. They share their failure stories. But here I found that students, and I'm not sure if it's totally a regional thing, a generational thing, what exactly it is, still fear failure. And one of the best ways not to fail is not to try something difficult, right? Which is sort of anathema to entrepreneurship. Uh, Ian covered this over, over focus on startups. Uh, this last point, I think is, or second to last, I think is, is really important too, is if I'm an entrepreneurship major, what job do I apply for? So Seth, let's say I'm going to apply for a job in your shop and I'm an entrepreneurship major. Knowing Seth, you would probably look on, upon that pretty favorably, but I would be worried that you wouldn't, right? So I'll major in finance or whatever, which is great, which is great. But it's sort of the what do I do with it if I don't start my own company? And of course, we're working on this right here with kind of a disjointed curriculum. I think we could do a little bit more to provide more of a, a pathway uh, through uh, at least the Paul College curriculum. Uh, this is really interesting. I'm not seeing a lot of necessity driving entrepreneurship at all in the current job market. I had a student who had to run out today because he had three different job offers and he had calls with the three different people that he was negotiating with to try to get the best possible offer. So uh, for those of us who graduated, had a talent of graduating to terrible job markets, that's not the case at all. So students have a lot of these kind of traditional options, which again, could be a good thing in the X plus five, X plus 10 sort of uh, framework. So a couple of more things is there are a lot of great events going on on campus, a lot of great student-led initiatives, right, or student-focused initiatives. There's Neil's FIRE program, there's UNH uh, Net Impact, there's the Entrepreneurship Club that we mentioned. Uh, the country's, I think, second or third, um, maybe even been the first. Mark, do you know the Ryan's Angel Fund? I think it was the first. Maybe it's the first. Student-run angel investment fund. Uh, which is pretty exciting. That's that up in the corner. They don't have a logo yet because they're so new. So I like to get with the Twitter, uh, Twitter clip, right? And then we have these formal events, right? One of our marquee ones that um, Mike has been the, uh, the godfather of, I think it's fair to say, run it for 28 years, right? Um, which is uh, the Paul J. Holloway Prize Innovation and Market Competition. The much newer but still engaging social venture innovation challenge, which we have the winner of here. Matt, is that right? Yeah, yeah Matt's the winner from this year's challenge, which is pretty exciting. And then we're working on doing more and more of sending our uh, students out to all of these external uh, competitions, which is really uh, exciting. But we can do all this stuff, great building box in place, but again, unless we get broader and deeper involvement from the students, uh, none of this really works uh, particularly well. Uh, so a quick thing on grants, and if you have any interest in grants, uh, over a beer later, I'm happy to talk about these uh, in detail. Um, this is the one that was originally mentioned, Pathways to Innovation, which is really about getting engineers and, and business students to work together. And then really recently, and again, this is a big honor, is an i grant that Mark and I are, are the PIs on, which is really exciting. So this map hasn't been updated, but right now in New England, the only schools that have um, i grants are uh, Dartmouth, UConn, Yale, MIT, and us. It's pretty exciting stuff, pretty good club, I think, to be a part of. And so circling all the way back to this idea about whether or not we can design a network to do what we want it to do, it's something that's not only of interest to corporations, it's important for what we do here on campus, uh, but now it's getting a lot of institutional support and financial support from entities like uh, the NSF. Um, so I've had some jobs in sales in the past, and so I never want to leave kind of a presentation without asking you to do something, and it doesn't involve cheering at all. Um, <laughs> but if you look at all the students we have, they're all kind of sitting in the back, uh, more or less, the back uh, third of the room, some things you can actually do to help us, the business professionals in the room or community members in the room, is help us make that employment case that these skills that we're teaching and these experiences that we're trying to foster are actually critical for employment. That you wanna see people with these skills walking into your office and interviewing uh, for jobs. That's a really powerful motivator and understandably so. Uh, bring us some problems to work on. Uh, I say this especially with the Paul College students. They're really great problem solvers, but sometimes focusing in on the problem can be the tough part. So if you have something in your business that's not quite working right, um, bring it to us and see if we can help you out, right? Not a lot to lose. Uh, definitely share your failures. Um, know that, you know, have people know that failures are totally normal and natural part of, of taking calculated risk and being an entrepreneur. Invite us in to see what your innovation process looks like. I've been a part of these in companies, both as a consultant and companies that I've worked for. And, and it's messy, it's confusing. Nobody really knows what they're doing. There's experimenting and there's arguing and there's you know, minimally viable products that quite literally explode, at least in the case of chemistry labs that I've been, right? <laughs> so show us that process and I think that will be emboldening for students to see that it's not this linear, easy thing, even for people with a lot of resources, a lot of experience. And then I would actually love to hear any other ideas uh, that you have uh, over a beer, um, which I really need because my throat's getting really dry. <laughs> and uh, as somebody, again, from, from Oregon who's on the Brew New Hampshire board, in an evening time like this, it's tough to avoid. Uh, running out for one of those. So that's all I had. 
and I'd be uh, super happy um, to talk with you afterwards. And I also encourage you to talk to our students that are, are here. I think you'll be amazed by the drive that they have, the uh, kind of entrepreneurial spirit that they have, and um, you know, all of the wonderful things that they're doing uh, here at UNH. And there's a whole bunch. It seems to be like filling in as I speak in the back. So um, that's all I have. And thank you for, thank you for, thank you for listening. Before we, we move on to that, that portion, um, does anybody have any questions or comments or um, need a discussion? Ross? So, uh, I'm a senior electrical engineer. I'm on staff here and uh, very much a serial entrepreneur. And uh, I hope the students are listening to this. I, I want your input on the requirements for angel investment money because I've constantly hit a wall. So I'm able to do design work and business plans and marketing plans and all that stuff that's required. But then I've often hit this wall that's a hundred to three hundred thousand dollar wall to build a prototype, to get some marketing done, to get a professionally produced video. I spoke to uh, one of the uh, Paul faculty members who said, well, everybody wants zero risk. <clears throat> So we want, you know, even to just get a few hundred thousand dollars, you know, we want to see the product, who your customer is. We want customers lined up at the door <laughs> in a perfect world, I guess. But what are they looking for? Sure. That's, it's a good question. I think every entrepreneur hits that. Um, I'm going to actually defer to Mark Kaplan if he's in the back. He's in the trenches every day with this. Uh, and I think, Mark, if you can answer that question, that'd be great. You've got it exactly right. That's exactly what they want. They want it all. So, you know, it's, it's a problem. I mean, I think the, the, a lot of times it's how do you make the compelling case for, for what you're presenting. Um, you know, we are here in New England. We have a certain mindset about risk. Um, it's different in other parts of the country. Um, so it's not easy. It's not easy to get angel money. It's not easy to get venture money. There are, we're, I'm involved with uh, Live Free and Start. It's a state initiative. One of the things we're working on is trying to increase capital access throughout the state, you know, for situations like this and many others that are out there. Uh, but, you know, traction is important. That's hard to do in a situation like you're talking about because you can't even get a prototype built. Um, you know, it's friends and family, it's all of the things that require, you know, a lot of risk in before you're going to get outside money coming in most of the time. The angel groups are getting more active, though. That's, that's a good thing. If anyone's not familiar with it, with it I would recommend Crunchbase, if you haven't yep. seen that website. <clears throat> There's a number of platforms. Crunchbase, AngelList is another one that uh, people actually make investments through. So. Everyone must be really thirsty. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, Joshua from Alpha. I'll just make uh, a quick shout out for, I know I've talked to a few students here and I bet there's a number more that are planning on uh, uh, applying to Holloway. And just want to let you know that uh, we're doing workshops um, sort of throughout the whole program uh, for, for you to have a better outcome for going through the Holloway process. So uh, make sure to you know, utilize the resources that are available here. We're here, here to help you. I think as a constant theme is to, and it's part of this event, is to rec recognize, again, it's, I, I, you know, sort of a light alluded, but it's a bit of the pebble putting it out. Like, it starts with you to tell the other 14,950 students that aren't here that we're here as a resource, and there are a lot of really talented people within the confines of this building as we continue to expand with alumni that are here to serve you, to help you, and help's okay. Like, I can tell you that in all my startups, I had mentors, I had network capability, I had, I had a de facto board through this thing called YEO, which is Young Entrepreneurs Organization, that, that bounced ideas, that went through similar experiences. It's, it's, there's no bravado to do it alone. Like, you have to do it together with people. So I encourage you to leverage everyone and everything that's here for your benefit. I wanted to introduce the group, too, to a couple of more people in the back. Elise Goodman and Chris King came a little bit late. Uh, they're part of I, what I think is a really interesting group of students that's actually doing an independent study that's based purely on launching their own company. So that's one of the ways that we're trying to address it with the support of, of Mike and with Neil and others, 
uh, to try to address that trade-off between tuition and credits and the time to work on your own business. That we're saying, hey, you know, you don't have to try to start this in your spare time on top of your part-time job and your full-time work at school. We're going to actually give you uh, some independent study credit if you if you hit these milestones and you go toward launching your own business. And they're part of the first group of 13 students who has agreed to go on this. Uh, what I think is kind of a fun journey so far. I don't know what you guys think, but uh, definitely talk to them about that program. And I'm really glad that they took the risk to do something uh, really completely completely new around entrepreneurship. And I think it's turning out really well. Um, although we're what five weeks into it, so we'll see, right? <laughs> Any other any other questions? We can continue this out in the other room as well. Yeah. What's the? They're five weeks into it. What's the? Uh, what's the sum and essence of the business that they're uh, they're embarking on? You guys want to share? <laughs> he wants to know about your about your business. Go, um, go ahead. Elevator pitch, go. <laughs> <laughs> so I've always been uh, incredibly interested in designing clothing. I don't know why. Not a lot. Not a large margin industry. Um, but uh, I, I grew up in North Common, New Hampshire, where uh, the same Tuckerman's Brewery um, it exists. And uh, me and my friends used to do the presidential traverse, the 20 mile hike down from the south side over Washington and down to Clay. Um, and uh, we used to think that it would be incredible to have like a leadership training thing while it was happening, peak by peak. So like through every peak of every mountain through the traverse, uh, you would talk about something that would be beneficial to your life in the future. Uh, so we designed a clothing company that uh, represented that entirely. Uh, and with every peak you cross, there is, it funds a leadership camp going across the White Mountains of New Hampshire and the presidential traverse. So I've sold these clothes for three product lines here in New Hampshire from 2014 on now to 2016 with my summer and uh, spring line coming out here right before spring break. Students love spring break. Um, so I'm gonna sell the tank tops I have there. Um, and we're uh, getting the chance to, which is incredibly bringing Andrew's point to full fruition here. Like I have no time to work on it. I'm a full student with a full job, with full obligations with, within a fraternity and an organization with like five minutes to spare a day. So having the opportunity to earn credit uh, and save time in my life but to work through his independent study gives me the chances to enter the hallway contest for a real purpose. If you can, um, please help me um, thank our speakers for such a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.